Good afternoon. My name is Kenneth Knespel. I'm the interim dean of the Ivan Allen College. On behalf of Georgia Tech, the Ivan Allen College, the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs, I'm pleased to welcome you to the First Center and this afternoon's conversation with General Petraeus. I've been asked as well to remind people to refrain from photography this afternoon at our event. It is an honor for all of us to welcome General Petraeus to Georgia Tech and to thank him for being with us this afternoon. Georgia Tech's strong relationship to the military is a central part of our history of research and education. It manifests itself above all through the service of generations of students and faculty and staff who have been in the military. The strength of our own ROTC units, Army, Navy, Air Force, is also a testimony to the generations whose service to the nation we remember this afternoon. I'm pleased to acknowledge as well the Callahan Memorial and Mr. Jim Gillespie for help in making this event possible. Colonel Leslie Callahan, for whom the Memorial Endowment is named, joined Georgia Tech's ISYE faculty in 1969 after a 25-year military career. A 1944 graduate of the U.S. Military Academy, he earned his master's degree and Ph.D. in electrical engineering. He established the Callahan Endowment in 1993, and I'm pleased to recognize that his son, Mr. Leslie Callahan, is with us today. General Petraeus's career embraces major transformations in American and world history in the past three decades. While we certainly recognize his leadership in Iraq and his ongoing participation in strategic initiatives in Afghanistan, we also remember, particularly at a time when we witness the horrors suffered by Haiti, his role as former Chief of Operations of the United Nations Force in Haiti. It is important for us to think about Haiti because this disaster also reminds us of the important role of the military in bringing humanitarian aid and security. It is such extraordinary events that remind us as well of the ways that the King legacy of service and peace celebrated yesterday on this campus and in this city also resonates with the humanitarian service and work of General Petraeus. Please join me in welcoming General Petraeus to Georgia Tech. Thanks very much to have you with us. Privilege, honor, privilege is mine. Thanks. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you all very much. Professor Adam Stuhlberg, co-director of the Center for International Strategy, Technology, and Policy will begin this afternoon's conversation with General Petraeus by posing several questions. Professor Stuhlberg will then invite our campus members of the audience to come to the microphones placed in the aisles and share a question with General Petraeus. Thank, Thank you. you. But first, I, uh, I own the microphone right now. You do. <laughs> Actually, I would like to make a couple introductory remarks. Um, and to say up front what a privilege it is to be here with you all, uh, what a pleasure it is to see so many folks with an interest in the topics that we'll discuss this afternoon, uh, to note that I don't think the Yellow Jackets have beaten up on Army and football for a little while here, so it's safe to come back. Um, but most importantly, to, to, to note some extraordinary folks who are actually in the audience. Uh, I just saw, for example, the great Senator Sam Nunn, 
uh, one of the great sons of Georgia, represented your state, our country, and the Senate for many years, and a true bipartisan supporter of our men and women in uniform. Where are you, sir, by the way? You've got uh, the state speaker, state representatives, state senators, uh, Cong U.S. congressmen. Uh, of course, you got your president right here. Gosh, I mean, I, if I was as handsome as he was, I'd probably have five stars by now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I should note, um, there are, I think, in this audience, uh, some distinguished members. Every member who graduated in the West Point class of 74 was a distinguished member. Could I have those classmates who might be here please stand up? Where are they? Keep a close eye on them, please. Make sure they don't go to sleep toward the latter stages of the session. Um, I stand before you as the representative of over 230,000 great young Americans, soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen and tens of thousands of Department of Defense civilians and thousands more diplomatic partners, all of whom are doing tough work for our country in difficult missions under very challenging conditions uh, against an enemy that, yes, is barbaric, but is also adaptive and does adjust and is a fierce opponent. I am very privileged to serve with these great Americans. It's been a True honor to be with them, especially uh, to have spent more than five years in the Central Command area of responsibility uh, since 9-11, and again, to represent them here today. Now, you know, generals normally come out, and um, frankly, the normal deal is that staff makes up a bunch of PowerPoint slides, and I stand up here and point my laser point pointer with great authority and knowledge and say, next slide. Um, and we thought we wouldn't do that today. Now, rest assured, I do have a full deck of PowerPoint slides if all else fails. Uh, and I will use some of them, indeed, to make some points, because I think it is often helpful to have illustrations, to show metrics, to show trends, and all the rest of that. I also have them because, of course, there is an asterisk on the First Amendment, and that is the inalienable right of U.S. Army generals to use PowerPoint <laughs> in any presentations that they make, uh, and a laser pointer, of course. Um, but I thought that a conversation, again, might be the most interesting, uh, because it allows you to take the conversation where you want it to go, um, and that, I think, is uh, precisely why many of you are here, and uh, I'm delighted uh, that you are again. I do want to test those who are flipping or getting to the right PowerPoints, though, early on. This is always an amusing experience for them as well as they're trying to guess which one the boss might call on. Ah, very good. Uh, <laughs> pretty good start. Actually, if you could go to the last slide in this presentation, uh, I actually want to point out again uh, something that is very special about those that I represent and that I'm privileged to command. Go to the reenlistment ceremony uh, in Baghdad. Uh, this is what 1,215 great soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines look like when they have their right hand raised in the air reciting the oath of enlistment. Uh, it's the largest ceremony of its kind that, that we're aware of. Uh, it was conducted in the headquarters of the multinational force in Iraq in Baghdad on the 4th of July, 2008. I was privileged uh, to be the re-enlisting officer. It was an extraordinary uh, event, frankly, and a very emotional event. When you realize that a number of these individuals had been in, they were all in combat, of course, as they did this, many of them on their second or third full year tour in combat. Some of them, one of those is, is a 15-month tour for those who were there during the surge. And they were raising that right hand, reciting the oath of enlistment, committing to another term of service with our military, recognizing that by doing so, they would likely be called upon to serve another tour 
in combat in Iraq or Afghanistan, and yet they did so willingly and with enormous pride. Now, they do it for a lot of different reasons. Uh, certainly, there's a wellspring of patriotism and a sense that they are serving a mission, a cause that is larger than self. Uh, there's a sense of privilege about being with others uh, whom you respect uh, and to continue to serve with them and again, very important missions. Heck, there's a tax-free bonus that goes with it in Baghdad that's not something you can dismiss. But that's not really why they were doing it. They were really doing this because of those on their right and left, because of those, again, with whom they have served in the brotherhood of the close fight. And again, I can tell you there is no greater privilege than to wear the uniform with individuals like this. And with that, I'll be happy to take the first question. Thanks. Before we get started, let me say on behalf of my colleagues and the students here at Georgia Tech, how thrilled we are that you're willing to engage us in conversation on some of the burning challenges facing our country these days on the international security front. And on a personal note, I also want to thank you for helping uh, get my students, my engineering colleagues, my superiors, and so yes, sometimes even my social science uh, colleagues off my back by really embodying uh, really what the best of PhDs in international affairs can really bring to the, to the, to, uh, the party here. It's an extraordinary uh, degree. Our, I, I highly our, recommend uh, it. <laughs> our country. Well, thank you. And I know that people didn't come here to, uh, to listen to what I have to say, but maybe what I would do is start with a few scene-setting questions uh, to encourage and, and to elicit uh, some ideas from our students. And I guess the first question I have to uh, ask you has to do with Afghanistan. And I was wondering if you could briefly, in a nutshell, summarize how you understand U.S. strategic and operational objectives in Afghanistan for the next 18 months or so, and how you go about measuring the success. Yep. And, and maybe in answering their questions, you can talk a little bit about how you translate the strategic objectives into those operational objectives in a manner that that balances our needs without overstretching ourselves. And with respect to the metrics, how do you assess the conditions that may be ripe for a future transition? Let me get my pen here. So, what are our objectives and how do we measure well, I got it. Um, I'm a professor. He's my straight man. We rehearsed this. <laughs> um, First of all, with Afghanistan, look, let's not forget why we're there. Uh, we are there for a very, very serious reason, and that's because that's where the 9-11 attacks came from. Uh, they were planned in Kandahar. Uh, initial training was done in, in camps to the east uh, in Afghanistan before they moved to Hamburg and to U.S. flight schools. So there's a completely direct link between extremist safe havens, Al-Qaeda safe havens that existed in Afghanistan prior to 9-11 and the attacks that took place uh, on 9-11. We have to make sure that those cannot be established again. Uh, now, what we have seen in Afghanistan after a very early uh, defeat, and I think it's fair to say that it was a defeat of the, the Taliban and the Al-Qaeda elements that were in and running Afghanistan, the Taliban in particular at that time, uh, in late 2001, 2002, uh, was an enormous reduction, uh, of course, in, in violence after that fighting was done. But then you saw each year, over time, a gradual uh, resurgence of the Taliban. And over time, that, there's always a fighting season in spring, summer, and early fall, and then it goes down in the winter. And each year it would come up higher and higher. In fact, we have a, a, a metric slide, if you will, that can show some of that. Uh, and they'll pop it up here in a second. Uh, and so this starts in 2004. You can see level of violence quite low. By the way, about, you know, this is the 100, just in case you can't see it. It goes up to about uh, 900, the highest ever. That was a complete outlier during the elections. Uh, this past August, uh, then 2005, and so on over through the end of 2009. And you can see the rhythm there that starts to be more pronounced. By the way, I was there in 2005, did an assessment at the request of Secretary Rumsfeld, 
on the way home from a second tour in Iraq as a three-star, and I came back and said that I thought that Afghanistan was going to be the longest campaign of the long war. That was when the level of violence was, as you can see here, relatively low. By the way, if you had an Iraq slide, this would be up somewhere around literally twice this uh, and, and above, and we could show you that if you want to see it later on. Um, so the level of violence grew and grew and grew as the Taliban reconnected. There was a great article in Newsweek, a cover article about two months ago that some of you may have seen that describes how this took place. They met each other again after having been dispersed, defeated again in late 2001, early 2002. Uh, started to put their foot in the water in Afghanistan again, then go back out and gradually rebuilt the infrastructure to the point that this past year, they had shadow governors, shadow Taliban governors for all but one of the 30-plus uh, provinces. So that is what we have seen. So clearly, uh, one of the major objectives has to be to reverse uh, that Taliban expansion uh, to provide greater security for the people. Uh, to help develop the Afghan forces so that they can first help us, partner with us as we are leading in many operations, and ultimately lead operations themselves so that we can indeed, as President Obama described in the uh, late summer of 2011, begin the transition of tasks to the Afghan forces, uh, begin a conditions-based process, and begin a responsible uh, reduction of our forces there. Uh, something that I believe is possible, that we can get the Afghan forces to that point, we can achieve conditions in certain parts of the country, we can uh, indeed uh, accomplish those tasks. Uh, and we have to build capacity for the Afghan uh, civil side, if you will, help them. This is helping our embassy and uh, USAID uh, partners and a number of different other coalition, uh, ISAF, NATO, uh, and other partners from around the world, from the international community. Uh, all of those are the kinds of tasks that we have to perform. Uh, and when you translate that into operational activities, what that means is that on the one end, on the very high end, and we are increasing these forces as well, our counter-terrorist, our special special operations forces, uh, will be increased to go after the Taliban leadership, the leadership of the other elements of the so-called extremist syndicate uh, that face us in uh, eastern Afghanistan in particular, the south being much more the, the uh, Afghan Taliban. Uh, that all the way over to the other side, which will be promoting reintegration of reconcilable members of former insurgent groups. And then coming in from that, the effort to uh, secure the population with our increased conventional forces to support the training and development and capacity building of Afghan forces and Afghan uh, institutions, uh, and also to uh, mobilize local communities in their own defense through local defense initiatives as well. So you run the spectrum, and it does have to be a comprehensive effort. That's how counterinsurgency is carried out. It is one that is indeed going to be more focused as a result of the discussions, the deliberations that we all went through with President Obama, which were very helpful in that regard in sharpening the thinking on our objectives, uh, in cautioning against the kinds of expansive rhetoric that might lead one to think that we were trying to turn Afghanistan into Switzerland or a Western industrialized democracy within a couple of years. We have to be measured in what it is uh, we think we can accomplish and what we must accomplish. Uh, now, the, this will be a metric. Next slide, another metric, violent simili- Oh, well, this is a density plot. Uh, go ahead, next metric. This shows, you know, how, how is the violence expanding and where is it? By the way, these are the critical areas here. Helmand Province, Kandahar, uh, Nangahar, Paktika, and so forth in the east, uh, Kunduz, uh, Herat, and so forth. So this will be focused efforts. Uh, next. Uh, this shows high-profile attacks. Interestingly, it's very, very jumpy. By the way, tragically, we saw some high-profile attacks uh, in Kabul yesterday. Hadn't seen anything like that for a year or so. The response of the Afghan forces was impressive, much better than last time. But nonetheless, the insurgents were able to get into the city and carry out five very nearly simultaneous attacks 
uh, attacking very symbols of the Afghan government. So again, this is a very tough, resourceful, and adaptive uh, enemy, but albeit one that is now causing vastly, vastly more civilian casualties and, and civilian deaths uh, than our ISAF forces, the NATO ISAF forces, particularly after General McChrystal uh, has emphasized so firmly the implementation of the so-called NATO tactical directive and counterinsurgency guidance that focuses on reducing the innocent loss of innocent civilian life, even if it means that we take a bit more risk uh, at some times in doing that. Next, there's actually some more of these violent civilian deaths. If you looked at this in Iraq, I'll go to this in Iraq just for a second, just to show you what that looks like. You can all pull that up next. This is, this is obviously a number that we want to reduce very much, but actually the number is by no means off the charts compared with, can you pull a rock up and just show? This for what it's worth is 3,700 deaths in a single month due to violence in Iraq uh, right before we launched the surge. And you can see how much of that has come down over time. Still too high, it's still in the neighborhood of between one and, and, and 200 or so is below 100 in November. Um, but uh, having said that, as you can see, a dramatic reduction. I might as well just show security incidents in Iraq as well, uh, if you can back it up. Uh, again, just to give you an idea, this is 1,800 security incidents in a week, and you can see how it's come down since the conduct of the surge, which was launched right in here and gradually drove that level of violence down to where it went from being, say, 220 attacks per day or so with Iraqi data thrown into it retroactively down to somewhere under 15, roughly 15 attacks per day uh, in recent months, as you can see there. So very substantial reduction. But we've got a lot of metrics on these. We focus in a whole host of different areas to try to get the kind of feel for this that is, is in, invaluable. It's in, irreplaceable. You have to have that. And in fact, the chief intelligence officer in Afghanistan was right to criticize the fact that we still do not yet have the capacity and capability uh, for the forces in terms of the intelligence community, uh, mostly military intelligence now, by the way, uh, that we should have, although we are building it. It's one reason he was sent there six months ago as well, is to help fix that. But back in the in the early part of 2009, at the end of the CENTCOM strategic assessment that I charted when I took over CENTCOM, we in fact went to the Director of National Intelligence and in fact offered a similar assessment. It's one reason there's now an Associate Director of DNI. There's it's one reason we have a Center of Excellence for Afghanistan and Pakistan at CENTCOM. It's one reason we have the AFPAC hand, a whole host of initiatives that over time will build that kind of capacity. That's crucial if you're to figure out who should be reconciled and who has to be, who is irreconcilable and therefore has to be killed, captured, or run off. You touched on this a little bit in, in your answer, but um, I was wondering, given your intellectual reflection on asymmetrical and irregular warfare as well as your practical experience, how do you see the relationship between our counter-terrorist strategies and operations and our counterinsurgency strategies and operations? Yeah, counter-terrorist operations are part and parcel of a counterinsurgency campaign. Uh, when we drove down the level of violence in Iraq, a key component of that was the effort to go after Al-Qaeda with both special mission units, by the way, these were commanded by then Lieutenant General Stan McChrystal, who's now the commander of our forces in Afghanistan, an, an exceptional uh, officer, commander, leader, uh, thinker, and everything else. Um, so the counter-terrorist element, crucially important, that's going after the high-end leaders. We had regular special forces, the Green Berets working with the Iraqi special operation. Actually, let's show me the, uh, the Anaconda slide. Um, let me illustrate. This is a hugely important concept uh, about how you have to do counterinsurgency because it's much more than just military forces. First of all, this, and just so you know, this is Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So it's a specific target set. It's the Sunni extremist elements within Iraq. Doesn't include the Shia militia. We had another campaign for that. So you have Al-Qaeda, Ansar al-Sunnah, Ansar al-Islam, a variety of other groups. Next. This is what they need to survive and to, to grow. They've got to have explosives, weapons. They have to have a flow of foreign fighters, many of whom are willing to blow themselves up in suicide operations. They need safe havens inside the country, and if they can get them outside the country, places where they can 
plan, uh, command and control, conduct media operations, get on the internet to proselytize, to recruit, to share ideas and so forth. They have to have popular support so the people aren't turning them in left and right. That requires an ideology. Uh, they need to be able to command and control their forces, albeit loosely in some cases. It, a lot of this is about money, by the way. The vast majority of these organizations aren't really in it for ideological or extreme religious reasons. Many of them are in it for money. Uh, and then they need guidance from the Al-Qaeda senior leadership located in the western part of Pakistan, because that, that's important to them. They're a franchise of Al-Qaeda, in this case, Al-Qaeda in Iraq. So we've got to challenge that. We've got to cut the flow of explosives and weapons. We've got to cut the flow of foreign fighters. By the way, we've cut that from through Syria from 120 a month to under 10 a month. Take away their safe havens. Uh, degrade the support of the people through information operations campaigns. Uh, that hang around, in this case, we hung around their neck three labels. Uh, extremist ideology, indiscriminate violence, and oppressive practices. And every time they blew up another uh, group of innocent civilians, a mosque, what have you, a bridge, we would hang those around them again. You have to challenge their ideology, discredit it, best done, of course, by uh, fellow religious adherents and by Arabs, in this case. Uh, you have to disrupt their command and control or shut it down, uh, reduce their access to money, various extortion campaigns and uh, various other illicit activities, uh, and then cut off their links to al-Qaeda senior leadership. And that's what we set out to do, and that's what we did to a considerable degree, but recognize, again, al-Qaeda in Iraq still very much has the capability, as we've seen periodically, to carry out horrific attacks. The last of those were back in early December of this past year in Baghdad. Next. Now, you've got to pressure all of that. Next, so how do you do it? Well, certainly military, the kinetic aspect is important. This is the high-end special mission units. Also, you have to take away their safe havens with conventional forces. You have to hold as well as clear and then rebuild them. You obviously want to have as many Iraqi partners as you can. And then over time, we were able through the awakening process, the reconciliation, to generate about 103,000 sons of Iraq. These were Sunni Arabs by and large, some actually a couple, tens of thousands of Shia Arabs as well, because we had some uh, anti-militia elements in this also. Uh, but they were basically helping us secure local areas. This is manpower intensive work. Next. But it takes more than that. It takes politics. And you've got to be involved in that, and along with your diplomatic colleagues. In my case, I had the best diplomat in recent history, the great ambassador uh, Ryan Crocker. So you've got to foster reconciliation legally, as well as through interactions with tribes that create the so-called awakening that we embraced when we saw the opportunities for it. Uh, and then you have to work very hard to identify any Sunni Shia or Arab Kurd pressures that are out there and can unhinge this process right here. You have to in a whole host of other areas in this regard, get them to pass budgets, help support with that. In fact, Iraq is in a bit of a... Uh, uh, political drama right now with an organization trying to uh, disqualify candidates for the parliamentary elections on 7 March. Next slide. But we'll work through that, and the Iraqi leaders have a grip on it. Intelligence is critical. Again, that is, that's the basis for the, the bulk of your operations, the proliferation of unmanned intelligence surveillance reconnaissance platforms, uh, un UAVs, predators, and so forth, hugely helpful in that regard. But it's really been about intelligence fusion. We've had breakthroughs in every discipline of intelligence, signals intelligence, human intelligence, imagery intelligence, and so forth. But the breakthrough has come from our ability to fuse all of these and to force everyone to work together. Cooperation is not optional. It is required. And we cr literally created fusion cells at every division headquarters inside Iraq, broke down the walls, literally, between the different agencies, required them all to be there and required them to talk to each other. It was amazing what happened. Next, detainee operations. We had over 27,000 detainees, the height of it in, in Iraq. We're now down under 5,000, having either released or transferred them after conducting rehabilitation, which was not something we were doing when we launched the surge. And in fact, what we had were were enclosures of 800 detainees that were basically being run by the most extreme of the extremists in that enclosure uh, and becoming terrorist universities. So we literally had to conduct counterinsurgency inside the wire to identify the irreconcilables, the hardcore, to literally mount an operation to go into this enclosure, pull that individual out, put him in newly created 
maximum security facilities so that you could work on rehabilitating those who were left, which was possible. Next. Now you also have to get at the root causes of why people would be drawn to extremism, to become insurgents in the first place, which typically stem from lack of opportunity, uh, inadequate jobs, uh, lack of services, insufficient education, extreme religion, all the rest of this. And so you've got to work with your partners, in this case, of course, the Iraqi partners and civilian partners to try to come to grips with a lot of that. And again, a lot of effort there as well. Next. But even that's not enough. Again, you've got to work on making sure they can't come through other countries. You've got to get source countries to make it difficult for a military-age male to fly in a one-way ticket to Damascus. We went around all the countries. Actually, the State Department counterterrorist ambassador did that. Great job. You cannot allow uh, the enemy to dominate the airwaves, the internet, cyberspace, <coughs> um, television, or what have you. And so we created a substantial information operations task force and did a lot of strategic communication uh, in that area as well. And it, as we'll mention uh, in Congress in the upcoming hearing, we do in fact need uh, additional uh, regulation, additional legal uh, uh, oversight for activities in cyberspace. It's one of the emerging areas uh, that we all understand the absolute, again, First Amendment rights and all the rest of that, but we also understand that the population needs to be protected and there have to be ways to come to grips with the ability of extremists, like the extremists in Yemen, uh, who recruited the, uh, the, the Christmas Day bomber and so forth. So again, what's the message? Comprehensive. You got to use everything. It has to be a, 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 as we called it, the anaconda plan because you're putting pressure on the network in every respect possible. That's obviously what we'll try to do in Afghanistan as well and are trying to do. Let me ask one more <coughs> question uh, as the students are filing up to the microphones. This question has to do with Pakistan. Uh, in many respects, it could be the center of gravity of our concerns in the region and, and clearly critical to the uh, effectiveness of our operations in Afghanistan. And many <clears throat> people talk about a trust deficit that has emerged between uh, uh, Pakistan and the United States. And I was wondering, from your vantage point, how do you see that? How can we bridge the gap so that we're focusing on the same mission uh, together? There has been a trust deficit. We have left Pakistan at least twice in the past. Uh, once uh, after, uh, indeed, uh, helping the Pakistani and funding the Mujahideen and others, uh, countering the Soviets in Afghanistan and, and on another occasion. And they remember that. Uh, and we have to combat that. We have to counter that by uh, working to build relationships. I've been in Pakistan about every 45, less than every 60 days, uh, since taking the job or meeting with uh, Pakistani army chief in particular uh, on a greater frequency uh, if he's in the United States who even met on one time in an aircraft carrier out in the Arabian Sea. Uh, I'm going to meet again here shortly. Um, so you've got to work that very hard. We do need to recognize, however, that Pakistan has taken some very, very tough decisions over the course of the last 10 months in particular. I don't know if you have a FATA or a slide that shows Northwest Frontier Province and the Fatah. If you have that, we'll pop that up and I'll just show you where they have been active going against the extremists that have threatened their very existence, to be sure, not necessarily the Afghan Taliban, but the Pakistani Taliban. And in so doing, they have also certainly uh, gone, bumped into and, and, and confronted some of the other extremist elements that have caused us troubles. Actually, if you have the extremist slide that shows the different insurgent elements for Afghanistan, we could put that up. And I just want to give you a sense of the texture of the enemy uh, that we're confronting in Afghanistan as well. Because what you have, uh, and again, I won't make you memorize this or do an eye test of all the different acronyms and everything else. Suffice it to say that the different colors, this of course is Afghanistan right here, uh, this is Pakistan. Note the, the lack of depth, by the way, between India uh, and Afghanistan for Pakistan, one of their huge concerns. But the takeaway from this is that, yep, you got Afghan Taliban in a substantial part of the country and in some other areas as well, uh, but you also have other extremist elements that make up the so-called syndicate, the Haqqani Network, Commander Nazir, Tariqi Taliban Pakistani, uh, the HIG, TNSM, Al-Qaeda, and others all throughout here. And 
So you're, we're, this is why you have to have a very, very rigorous and granular understanding uh, of who it is that you are fighting, what it is you're confronting uh, when it comes to leaders, uh, ideologies, uh, groups, and so forth. And actually, this does show, I can show you that what the Pakistani Army and Frontier Corps have done with uh, considerable courage this past year was fight to clear the Pakistani Taliban and an associated element, uh, the TNSM, out of SWAT in the Northwest Frontier Province. They've operated in Bajur, Momon, and Khyber, three of the tribal agencies of the Federally Administered Tribal Agency. Uh, and then they've carried out a very important operation down in eastern South Waziristan, another one of the Fatah areas, uh, against uh, Baitullah Massoud's organization. Uh, these organizations that have carried out horrific attacks against everything from uh, Pakistani uh, military officials, uh, hotels, even visiting cricket teams. Uh, they have done these with, with commendable uh, tactical uh, operations, uh, and we are working very hard to support their consolidation of those gains and then indeed capitalizing on those gains uh, in the new year. Great. Well, why don't we go ahead and start taking some questions from the field okay. here. Why don't we start with a student here in the middle? Great. Sure. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a bit about uh, concerns that the number of counterinsurgent forces in Afghanistan is and more importantly will remain significantly below the 20 to 1,000 sort of target ratio. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned, it's manpower intensive. We put that number. I personally actually made the decision in the end of the day to put that number in the counterinsurgency field model. There was a big debate about it. There was actually literally, I mean, I was staring a confirmation hearing in the, in the face possibly uh, with some of Senator Nunn's former Senator Armed Services Committee colleagues. Um, and, you know, it's the kind of number that gets thrown back at you. People can do math just as you can. Uh, and it was, by the way. In fact, I think it was Senator Clinton or Senator Jack Reed, one of the two that, that uh, quoted that number and asked about it with respect to Iraq. Uh, and you are right that even with the surge of U.S. forces, the additional seven, 8,000 NATO forces, the additional Afghan forces for some period, uh, we will not meet that threshold of the kind of ratio that is traditionally uh, seen as a, as a requirement for successful security uh, of populations in counterinsurgency operations. But as I showed you on an earlier slide, it's not the whole country that is battling an insurgency. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a, a, another slide, of course, that shows that I think it's something like 70% of the violence is in 10% of the, of the districts, as an example. So the, the important areas, we can concentrate those forces, and that is indeed the thrust. Uh, General McChrystal has identified the 80 or so key districts and then a number of others that are also uh, essential. That's where we will focus our attention. We believe that if we can indeed improve the security in those areas and then along the lines of communication, uh, that connect them and gradually increase those ink spots, if you will, those spots of security, that uh, that can provide the kind of increased security that allows development uh, of the Afghan forces, because it's tough to build forces if, you, if they think they're going to get killed when they go home at night or their daughter will be kidnapped on the way to school or the school will be blown up uh, if it's that difficult a period. Uh, so, and then more importantly, over time to, to allow Afghan civil institutions uh, to take hold as well and to ensure, of course, that they're not uh, given to corruption and that they don't undermine what the effects that we're trying to achieve uh, in this campaign. So that's how I would answer that question. Thank you. Why don't we take a question from that end? Okay. Um, about three weeks ago, Senator Lieberman said in an interview, quote, Iraq was yesterday's war. Afghanistan is today's war. If we don't act preemptively, Yemen will be tomorrow's war. Could you please elaborate a little bit on Yemen, the situation in Yemen, and the U.S. strategy? I could. Uh, I've actually personally been focused on Yemen for over two years. Uh, when I was the commander in Iraq, uh, we watched very intently, as I mentioned, where foreign fighters came from. We watched what was going on in the area outside Iraq, because a lot of these that were coming in, and keep in mind this is over 120 foreign fighters were coming into Iraq at the time, just imagine the impact 
if even half of those are willing to blow themselves up in carrying out a suicide attack. Uh, and we did focus in on uh, Yemen. Uh, it was an area where in 2006 there was a, uh, a jailbreak uh, that led to the freedom of a number of uh, terrorists who had been detained. Some Gitmo uh, detainees had been returned. Uh, they were back on the streets. They were putting roots down again. It's a country that has a lot of the conditions that someone might send, say it was sent from central casting for uh, the establishment of uh, terrorist networks and cells and even, even an insurgency, if you will, uh, built around those elements. Uh, it is, you know, a lot of the bin Laden traces his family back there. There's a lot of connections, uh, again, uh, to the tribes in these very mountainous, uh, remote areas uh, and so on. And we saw this grow over time. And in fact, when I took command of Central Command in, at the end of October 2008, uh, that was one of two countries where I said that we really needed to do more, recognizing we were going to do more in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, we we're going to sustain what we had in, in, in Iraq, sustain those gains, um, but that we had to really focus a lot more attention. We actually built a campaign plan. Uh, it was published at the end of April last year. Uh, we did not yet have all the partnership pieces in place. Now it's known that I went in there in July of last year. Uh, we kept that secret for quite a while, actually, uh, but it came out, I think, about a month or so ago. In fact, I was known I was in there on the 2nd of January as well. All of that built up to the point where, and now, by the way, last year, Al-Qaeda in Yemen was franchised. It was made Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula by Al-Qaeda senior leadership in Western Pakistan. Uh, and, but the simultaneously we're starting this effort to build that, and that was what enabled the operations that were carried out against Al-Qaeda in Yemen uh, back in, uh, I think it was the 17th of December, 24th of December. Two training camps were taken out, some uh, high-level leaders uh, killed, and also four suicide bombers, three killed, one uh, wounded and captured by the uh, Yemeni sensitive site exploitation team that followed up on that particular operation. Uh, now, the, the Detroit bomber was already in the pipeline at that point, as is now well known. It already left El uh, Yemen after having presumably been provided the ex advanced explosive and the training to use it uh, during the several months in Yemen. Uh, and this is, again, a country where you, you need a comprehensive approach. Thankfully, there are a number of neighbors in the region with substantial resources, Saudi Arabia, Foremost among them also the United Arab Emirates, so Oman, uh, Qatar, other countries in the Gulf states that obviously want to in help uh, the leadership in Yemen deal with the problems. Uh, they not only have Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, as you probably know, they also have the Houthi rebellion in the north, southern secessionists. Uh, you know, the oil is going down. Well, thankfully, gas is going up. but. Uh, uh, and, and a host of different challenges and problems with a government that is really, uh, you know, the country was in a civil war up until about 10 years ago. So this is a real difficult spot. We want to be sure that it doesn't become another Somalia, another failed state. Uh, there are challenges, needless to say, galore in, in Somalia, including Al-Qaeda in, in East Africa, although its leader was killed in an operation carried out about four or five months ago. So. Lots of challenges in Yemen, and we've got to keep our eye on that ball as we keep a lot of other plates spinning throughout the Central Command area and, indeed, throughout the world. Thank you. Why don't we take a question from this side? Sir, um, I'd actually like to uh, ask you to go back a little bit to when you were at another institute of higher learning, um, back in another international affairs school. Um, and would you speak to how that experience affected, hopefully valuably, the way your thinking is now operationally about strategic um, issues and about policy. Um, and if you would specifically comment on U.S. grand strategy, or the lack thereof, um, does the lack of a U.S. grand strategy represent a vulnerability from a military or operational perspective? Or is the military strategy emerging as the de facto grand strategy for the U.S.? Well, first of all, uh, to my graduate school experience, which was, you know, 
And a lot of people asked afterwards, hey, what was it that prepared you when you were all of a sudden in this situation in northern Iraq as the commander of the 101st Airborne Division? You're basically told, you know, you're uh, sort of the proconsul of the north. Um, and I was looking for all these folks, you know, where's the man from Orha, where's the, you know, where's these guys and those guys, and frankly, there weren't any. Uh, or if they were, they were in another location uh, in the Kurdish region. And so we had to get on with it. Uh, truthfully, my service in Haiti as a chief of uh, the UN force down there in the mid-90s, operations in the Balkans over the years, some other operations helped enormously. But of all things, what helped the most was actually that graduate school experience. Uh, and I've told that to people, and it was because at graduate school, I went there, by the way, from being at the Command General Staff College, and it's a great institution of higher learning as well. Uh, we call it the, you know, the intellectual critical mass of the Army or something. Um, but, and we had, we thought, fierce debates, by the way, really big debates, but they turned out they're about like this on the spectrum of a spectrum like that. And I learned that when I went to uh, Princeton. Um, and I went there, by the way, rather than some alternatives because they had the fewest number of military students there and you couldn't sort of hide behind somebody else. You couldn't hide behind a bunch of military fellows or something like that. So it was an extraordinarily challenging uh, endeavor. Um, not trying to brag, but I was the number one in my class of a thousand at the Command General Staff College. Thought, you know, I was reasonably, you know, alert fellow. And uh, I went to graduate school and, you know, I decided, hey, what's the toughest thing you can do? Well, let's get a PhD. Let's knock that out in a couple of years. So I had to take advanced macroeconomics at the graduate level. I'm sorry, advanced micro was the first torture. So uh, <laughs> it violated, that did violate my civil rights and a few other things, but, uh, you know, the interrogation techniques and so forth. But um, I got a... I think I got a D or something like that on my first advanced microeconomics uh, exam. I mean, this is a real shocker. So A, it's really hard, because I didn't have much of an economics background, but you know, why should that matter? Uh, so anyway, <laughs> learned a thing or two about that. But more importantly, I learned there's some seriously, seriously smart people in this world who hold very different views about some pretty important topics than I do. And so we thought, you know, why is this? And inevitably, obviously, they have some different assumptions about, you know, anything from the state of nature of mankind, you know, their Kantians and I'm a Hobbesian or something, you know, whatever it may be, um, and, and so forth. So it was quite an experience. And so when I was in Iraq, um, you know, by, by the way, I mean, economics actually paid off up there. I actually convinced them, you know, if we opened the border and allowed free flow of electronic goods in, the price would actually go down, not up. Um, and it did. Uh, we also, you know, one quick story, if I could. We were, we were up there, and it, this is pretty dicey stuff. I mean, we just didn't have a whole heck of a lot of help, and so we just got after it. I told our guys that we were going to do nation building and got this stunned look because, you know, um, weren't going to do that, but we did. So we got on with it, and uh, it wasn't optional. Uh, and so we started into this, and I finally found a guy up there who had the money. We knew that there was a bank that had saved a bunch of money, and it turned out they'd flooded the basement, they'd packaged it all so it was safe. So we went to this guy and said, okay, hey, great work. I understand you saved a lot of money. He said, I did. And I said, that's terrific. Do you have enough to pay the salaries of the government workers? Basically, everybody in Iraq was a government worker, by the way. There's very little free enterprise. And uh, he said, I do. And I wanted to hug the guy. And so anyway, uh, I said, well, that's terrific. Um, well, why don't we do it? He said, well, well, I don't have the authority. This is always about authority. I said, well, who has the authority? Well, he said, it's the Minister of Finance in Baghdad. And I said, well, if you haven't checked lately, there is not a Minister of Finance in Baghdad anymore. He, went, he ran off. Uh, there's no deputy. In fact, there's not even a ministry uh, there anymore. He said, yeah, this is really sad. So he said, but you know what, General? You have the authority to do it. And I said, you're darn right I do. And so... <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. So I pulled out a four-star piece of card stationery that we have. You know, the aide pulled it out of his rucksack, and I wrote, you know, he said, make it an order, please, an order. We, we like orders. <laughs> so I said, you know, to the bank manager, you are ordered to pay the salaries of the civil servants of Nainoa province. 
And he looked at it and said, well, no stamp. <laughs> so, so no kidding, I'm not, I'm not making this up. We went out into the souk the next day and we designed a stamp. It had all kinds of stars on it and flags and everything else. We stamped everything merrily. So anyway, um, he says, okay, we're gonna do it. He said, it'll take me a few days to organize it. We have to position the cash at all the different bank outlets and all the rest of this. We have to verify lists. We have to do hum hum. He said, super. Well, that night at midnight, because of my extraordinary graduate school experience there, in particular that in economics, um, I woke up in the middle of the night and said, my God, we have a closed economy because none of the borders were open. So we have a fixed amount of goods and we're about to inject a whole bunch of money. And the only result will be inflation. Very good. That, that was Senator Nunn. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, so, really, I did. This is, this is a big challenge. So, I went to the governor the next day. We'd had the first election in Iraq back in 5 May, and I had a partner. And I said, uh, Governor, you've got a problem. He, and he would, this is a game. I'd say, Governor, you have a problem. He'd say, General, we have a problem. I'd say, okay, let's get on with it. So, I said, how are we going to get more goods in the marketplace so that when we get all this extra money, we just don't, it just doesn't bid up the prices for what's there? He said, well, if you considered opening the border with Syria. And I said, well, what border? So we you know, got that education and um, called the headquarters down in Baghdad and said, hey, I think we might open up an international border. They said, knock yourself out. We've got other things to worry about. Um, word didn't quite get back to the State Department, but that's OK. <laughs> General Powell spoke to me about that later. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, so I got my lawyers together that night. I said, okay, three days from now, we're going to open the border with Syria. I need all the, uh, you know, international legal uh, references you can pull together, the UN Security Council resolutions on trade with Iraq and so forth. You've got to do it street legal. And you develop the promulgating instructions. Uh, by the way, I also took an international law class there uh, in, in uh, Princeton. So anyway, we got it all together, long story short, got a great brigade commander out there, negotiated with the tribes, and got all the different 12 different agencies that had to be included in this, and we went out and cut the ribbon and reopened the border, and hundreds of trucks were already lined up there uh, wanting to get into Iraq. And lo and behold, got all those goods and services, goods uh, into the marketplace in Iraq, and actually prices went down a little bit. They were astonished. They were believers in capitalist economics. Not quite. Uh, we brought in two PhDs from Princeton, in fact, to talk about uh, free market economics, to talk about political philosophy and all the rest of that. That stuff came in handy. Um, but most of all, I think, it was the, the notion that not everybody sees the world in these confines right here, which can be the perception you develop if you live the kind of uh, grindstone cloister syndrome that we in the military occasionally live, and that is a somewhat cloistered existence with our nose to the grindstone and don't look up very often. So it was a, you know, a hugely valuable experience to me. It's one I've recommended to everybody since then. Um, I just wouldn't recommend taking advanced microeconomics without having an economics background as an undergraduate. Uh, but I did, for what it's worth, I, I ended up getting an A on the final exam, so it turned out okay. <laughs> This is kind of a follow-up question to the question previously about Yemen. Uh, Martha Coakley, the Attorney General of Massachusetts and current Senate candidate, recently stated that Al-Qaeda had left Afghanistan and moved to Yemen and Pakistan. Uh, do you agree with that assessment, which is basically that currently the only people remaining in Afghanistan are the ta Taliban and other groups? And if so, do you think we need to do more in Yemen and Pakistan? Well, um, let me just... I'm not going to get into the domestic politics of all this thing, if I could. I mean, I showed you a slide that included the kaleidoscope of extremist elements that are in Afghanistan before that question was asked, and mentioned al-Qaeda as an element of that kaleidoscope. Uh, I think that various individuals have said there are not many al-Qaeda, al-Qaeda specifically inside Afghanistan, but clearly there are al-Qaeda um, relatives uh, with whom there is a symbiotic relationship, as uh, Secretary Gates described, I think very compellingly and effectively. I'd recommend you read his opening statement 
uh, before, I think it was the Senate Foreign Relations Committee briefing after the President announced his decision on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, now, with respect to Yemen, yes, we need to do more. I mean, I've just, I think, made that case. In fact, not only that, we plan to do more. We have submitted, for example, uh, funding recommendations that were part of the budget that was recently approved and signed into law by the President of Defense Appropriations Bill uh, that would more than double the security assistance provided if they're all approved and they, and they haven't been yet. There's a certain category of funding. Um, but we reason believe, I think, that it probably will, given the emphasis on that. And then there's also a, a sustained stream in the uh, economic fund. But the truth is that really Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and others uh, will contribute vastly more than we will, although perhaps our training assistance and advice and that kind of thing may be of signal value. Uh, and then in Pakistan, uh, we have all, I think, said that this will take a sustained, substantial commitment. Uh, that is represented by the Kerry Luger bill that provides $1.5 billion per year in economic assistance for five years. Uh, and then on the security assistance side, roughly the same amount goes up a little, little or down depending on when the coalition support funding falls in, in what particular year. Uh, and again, we are working hard uh, to sustain that and where the Pakistanis uh, want additional uh, training assistance, uh, equipping and so forth, certainly trying to uh, meet those requirements as well. Um, again, this partnership is hugely important, and it is about building relationships um, so that individuals realize that we're there for the long haul, and we are not going to do to Pakistan what we have done at least twice, some people argue three times, uh, before. Thank you very much. Sure. We take a question on the far end. Increasingly, we are hearing about Iran in the news with the rise of the Green Movement, possible secret nuclear facilities. Um, from a military perspective, what do you see as our role in that country should the bottom drop out, so to speak? Uh, gosh, I mean, that's a hypothetical that I, I'm not sure I'd head down that road with respect. I mean, let me talk about it a bit more broadly. Uh, as I mentioned to an earlier group today, um, interestingly, the best recruiting officer for U.S. Central Command in uh, our region is President Ahmadinejad of Iran. Uh, because of his uh, rhetoric, because of the actions of Iran, because of the continued arming, training, funding, directing of Shia extremist elements uh, in Iraq, albeit they're operating at a lower level, uh, but still there. Uh, certainly they were defeated in the militia uh, fights of March and April of 2008, but, but again, residual elements, resilient, and in some cases, resurgent. Uh, certainly the continued uh, support for Lebanese Hezbollah, uh, Hamas, uh, weaponry to them, uh, and to a lesser degree uh, the Taliban in western Afghanistan, among some others. Uh, the missile programs, the uh, nuclear programs, uh, a variety of asymmetric uh, military uh, capabilities that have been developed, all the rest of this is of enormous uh, concern to those on the other side of the Gulf. And so you now have, for example, eight Patriot missile batteries, U.S., where there were zero a couple of years ago, two in each of four different countries, uh, gr much greater interest in uh, purchasing our arms and, uh, again, various forms of weaponry, greater interest in shared early warning. Um, we have been able, through bilateral arrangements, uh, to integrate those into multi multilateral effects. We call it bi-multilateralism. Um, we have a whole host of initiatives there. And I mean, there's a single small country on the west side of the Gulf that, just tiny country, a uh, million or so people, uh, purchased $18 billion worth of U.S. arms and equipment uh, last year. Nine billion in foreign military sales, nine billion in direct commercial sales. Uh, that gives you some sense of the concerns and worries that they have uh, about Iranian activities. Uh, and again, that's why many of them are interested in solidifying the relationships uh, with us to a much greater degree than was the case uh, even just a few years ago. Now, actually, let me talk one other thing about what's happened inside Iran. 
because it really is unprecedented since the revolution in 1979. Uh, what you have is a level of sustained um, discontent protest that has never been seen before and it, and it is continuing and you just can look from event to event, whether it's a religious celebration, the 40th day of mourning of the most recent individual killed, whatever it may be, and there's a couple of those coming up that we're watching, uh, the unrest has grown in each case. And it's a reflection, of course, it stems from this hijacked election that took place last summer uh, when it was recognized that Ahmadinejad might not win, uh, that Mousavi might, might beat him, then uh, they you know, literally hijacked the election and the people uh, were not in the least bit fooled nor amused. Um, and so that unrest has, has developed further and further and further. The Green Movement has taken some degree of roots but in response, what's happened is the Supreme Leader has had to turn ever more to the security forces to maintain the grip uh, on the situation. And so the result is that the Revolutionary Guards Corps, the Quds Force, and the besieged militia in particular, those three organizations have achieved greater and greater prominence because they are the organizations to whom the Supreme Leader has to turn and, and who are the most loyal. But we've even seen cracks in some of those organizations, uh, as you may have seen during the most recent of the protests that took place. Uh, and so it's a real knife's edge that, you know, if he overdoes it, it, it incites the mobs even more. Um, if he underdoes it, they can get out of control. And it's a very difficult situation. But what it means is that Iran has gone, this is a pundit's phrase, but this particular pundit has, has has assessed that Iran has gone from being a theocracy, if you will, to a thugocracy, where the thugs have really strengthened their grip on the institutions of state. They are also vastly more uh, into a whole variety of different economic entities, banyads as they're called, and others. Uh, and we see this uh, particularly in a country like uh, Iraq, where numbers of these different front companies and so forth are employed to try to exploit soft power as well as uh, the hard power that they have used there traditionally also. So it is a very, very tricky and very sensitive time there. Um, and in fact, in some respects, it makes uh, diplomacy uh, perhaps ever more challenging because of the, the lack of solidity of the foundation uh, that those leaders may feel they have uh, in their country. Can we take a question over here? Just wondering if you could comment on <coughs> uh, basic, the use of contracting forces in Afghanistan, Iraq, and any of the, I guess from a commander's perspective, difficulties with you know, lack of oversight or chain of command issues yeah. or any of that? It's a great question because obviously we've used uh, contractors uh, increasingly. Uh, and in fact, we generally now have in Iraq, for example, about the same number of contractors as we have U.S. troops. And in fact, they'll come down about the same number uh, through the course of the drawdown. As you know, we're about 111,000 in Iraq now going down to under 50,000 by the end of August uh, this year. And frankly, without the contractors, we couldn't do what we do. I mean, the contractors are performing hugely important tasks. By the way, remember that it, the vast majority of the contractors are actually not out toting guns and, you know, as surrogate security or something like this, although there certainly are some of those elements, and there have been, been issues with them without question, the Blackwater case uh, being very prominent among those, needless to say. Uh, but the bulk of them are on our bases. They cook our chow, they cut our hair, they uh, maintain the generators, they do a whole host of housekeeping. I, when I was the commander in Iraq, I said, look, Here's the big idea. Only our forces can go outside the wire and do what they do. So let's figure out how we can replace as many of those of our forces, even if it's guards and towers. Somebody else can do that. I don't expect somebody coming through the wire anyway. We had very substantial force protection, usually two different layers, so that two car bombs couldn't get through, which we got hit with three different times. You know, do not forget the level of violence that was uh, extent in Iraq at that time uh, and how what wonderful work our troopers did there along with our Iraqi partners and coalition partners to drive that down. But um, again, these contractors enabled us to do what only we can do and that is go out the wire, outside the wire. Now again, there are some security contractors that do go outside the wire. 
Um, and again, if they can't do it, then our forces have to do it. And uh, State Department, other organizations, uh, a lot of the different international elements that are there all hire these contractors because, again, uh, they can get those and they may not be able to, to get us. Uh, so that's the kind of challenge. Now, in terms of oversight, while I was a multinational force Iraq commander, we sought and got UCM, Uniform Code of Military Justice Authority over those that work for the Department of Defense. And we've, we've exercised this at various times. And also there was an arrangement, those had gone back to the states where you could forward a case to the Department of Justice. Uh, there are arrangements on the State Department side uh, made as well. Uh, and then also huge efforts to coordinate the activities so that in a very, very tense situation in some cases, you know, in a, in a world where someone may drive a, you know, a suicide uh, vehicle at you, um, you need to know who those guys are with the guns that are coming at you. Uh, so to coordinate those activities as well, we work very, very hard. and virtually eliminated issues of fratricide and that type of thing, which we had some cases of uh, prior to that time. So there's a lot of effort to increase the oversight, to establish legal jurisdiction, uh, and so forth. Um, in fact, the, the tremendous lawyer I had at that time, it was my legal counsel five different times, is now not coincidentally in Afghanistan, Brigadier General Mark Martins, uh, Rhodes Scholar, uh, Harvard Law Review, UVA, uh, law and all the rest of that, terrific officer. Uh, and he is now helping with the uh, detainee operations, rule of law effort, and some other things over in Afghanistan. Real selfless soldier. Get something from the center. Good afternoon, sir. It's an honor to be able to be here and listen to you to speak Thanks. today. Um, my question's in regards to, to the president's uh, uh, timetable that he set, uh, the specific date in order to start pulling uh, troops out of, out of mm -hmm. Afghanistan, and the specific benchmarks we have set uh, for security forces, Afghani security forces, uh, to reach before that time. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you could speak on, on our ability to reach that specific benchmark yep. and, uh, and maybe some specifics on how we are going to reach that benchmark. Yep. Well, I mean, we're going to reach it by uh, vastly increasing the effort to develop the uh, numbers and quality of Afghan forces. So one of the big emphasis right now is partnering with those Afghan forces that are in the field and increasing the number of trainers so that we can in increase the output of the various uh, training academies and training centers and so forth that exist. Uh, again, very, very important. Uh, and then to drive down the level of violence in various local areas so that it is at a level that the Afghan forces can deal with with their increased capability. Uh, they will grow in terms of numbers quite substantially over the course of this year and, again, hopefully in terms of, of quality and just sheer capability uh, as well. Um, so, and I think that that is, is doable. And again, remember the President said conditions-based and responsible when talking also about the drawdown. I think, you know, again, it's important to recognize that he was sending two uh, key messages in his remarks at West Point. And I was up there, and I'm an alumnus of that place. It was a real thrill. By the way, I grew up grew up seven miles away from West Point, so it was going home as well. And what he was conveying was, uh, on the one hand, a message of uh, increased commitment, resolve, resources, troops, civilians, money, and so forth uh, were in this. And on the other hand, though, a message of urgency. And that message had a lot of different targets out there, among them the, the Afghan leaders, some leaders in uniform, we've got to get on with this, um, and our partners uh, in Afghanistan and so forth. I mean, we have to recognize the reality that we have been at this since late 2001, early 2002. Um, and, you know, there are various clocks out there. We, I used to talk about the Baghdad clock and the Washington clock when I was the commander in Iraq. And, you know, the Baghdad clock, if it moved at all, it wasn't moving very fast. In fact, occasionally, you know, you'd sort of hit it to see if it still was moving and making progress. And then in the early days of the surge, and then you had the Washington clock that was just speeding forward. And, you know, you're afraid that time was going to elapse on that particular clock before you could demonstrate sufficient progress. And, and thankfully, uh, we were able to do that before that very important hearing that Ambassador Crocker and I conducted in September 2007. 
Uh, in this case, of course, you've got the Kabul clock, you have the Washington clock, and you have clocks in other capitals as well, given the significant coalition force that is there and, and the additional commitment that they're going to make also. So uh, they need to know, again, everyone needs to know that we are intent on getting about this as fast as we can uh, without obviously rushing to failure. And I think that's something you also have to avoid. Thank you, sir. Take a question from that. Thank you, General Petraeus, for speaking with us. Uh, your dissertation reflected your opinions on the military lessons learned in Vietnam. Um, how have you used those lessons in your career, and can you explicate some of the similarities and differences between Vietnam and Afghanistan? Well, um, interestingly, the most important lesson I took from that whole dissertation effort, which was indeed about the American military and the lessons of Vietnam, it was really lessons on the uh, use of force and advice on the use of force. But the most important lesson had to do with lessons of history. Uh, and that is to recall that every situation is unique. Each has its own context, its own unique circumstances. And the key to, to trying to get it right in each case is to recognize those unique characteristics as you perhaps import lessons from another endeavor, uh, let's say from Iraq into Afghanistan as an example. Uh, and so what we have sought to do, frankly, uh, is to avoid saying, gosh, you know, let's see, is Afghanistan like Vietnam? Well, it is in this case, it's not in this case. It's in, in, there have been people that have done that, and you know, you can identify a whole host of differences. You can also identify uh, some similarities. Uh, but what's much more important is spending your time figuring out Afghanistan, really understanding it in and of itself and not as you know, how it is or is not like some other situation. And then if you want to bring in lessons from previous experience, like Iraq, uh, recognize the context in which they were learned, in which they were gathered, uh, as you try to import them to a situation that's very, very different. In fact, I, I remember one, when I came back, as I mentioned from that assessment in Afghanistan in September 2005, of course, I made a PowerPoint, I made a bunch of PowerPoint slides, but I made one PowerPoint slide that was titled, Afghanistan is not equal, the not equal sign, um, Iraq, and laid out all the differences between the two, um, so that again, we went, went at that with clear eyes uh, as well. So I think that actually, interestingly, is the biggest lesson, and it sounds, you know, incredibly simplistic. Um, an incredible statement of the obvious, but it only is once you've actually embraced that statement of the obvious. Uh, and of course, I offer that recognizing that four-star generals get paid to state the obvious. Um, but so that's what I really, really took from that. Thank you. Take a question from the center, please. Uh, General, I just want to start. Thank you for your service to our country. Um, Thanks, it's a privilege. Given the recent success in the surge in Iraq, I was just wondering, given the differences between Iraq and Afghanistan, which actually you just sort of touched on, what must we do differently in Afghanistan and the surge there in order for it to be just as successful? Well, first again, you have to recognize the differences between a country in Iraq that's much more urban, Afghanistan much more rural, Iraq much more developed, uh, incredible blessings of resources. Not that Afghanistan doesn't have those, because it does. It has exceptional, extraordinary mineral wealth in, in a host of different areas, but you can't extract them anywhere near as easily as you can extract the uh, unbelievable amounts of oil that, uh, and natural gas uh, and sulfur that Iraq has. Uh, the differences in the education of the populations, the differences in the history of, of strong central government or not strong central government, uh, the roles of tribes in each country slightly different. Um, how in one area you have almost village by village, valley by valley uh, differences. Uh, Iraq, you have a bit more uh, coherence, at least with sub-tribes and then amalgamating into larger tribes and super tribes and so forth. So uh, again, it's, you have to have that kind of nuanced appreciation of the situation on the ground in Afghanistan, not just at that macro level, but then uh, on the ground, really understanding uh, which tribe is which, uh, again, who might be reconcilable, who may not be 
reconcilable. Um, the qualities, the strengths and weaknesses of different local leaders, uh, how systems used to work, how they now work, how they're supposed to work, uh, and all the rest of that. Uh, and indeed, in Afghanistan, you know, there's, there's a willingness to, and a recognition of the need to uh, enable, to restore, in some cases, the structures that have traditionally uh, organized, the social organizing structures that have resolved local disputes, that have allocated uh, various resources and so forth at local levels that have traditionally, in a sense, run local areas of the country uh, and ultimately link into what comes out of, of Kabul. So again, it's that kind of appreciation that's uh, very important. And it's one reason that we're pursuing local defense initiatives in certain areas, small special forces teams going out just living with uh, villages and then helping to mobilize them uh, against the Taliban uh, so not just bringing in outside Afghan national security forces, but getting the locals engaged in this as well, which is something we obviously did in Iraq also, but you have to do it in a slightly different way in Afghanistan. All right. Thank you, sir. Question for you. Hello, General Petraeus. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. I really appreciate your coming. Pleasure to be here. I have a, an important question for you. Uh, General Douglas MacArthur, the Supreme Commander of the Pacific Theater, Supreme Commander of the Korean War for a time, and uh, one of the few Americans that could actually fit another star on the epaulette. Um, and an American we all, whom we all walk in his shadow, once said that in war there is no substitute for victory. And I would like to know of you, in your opinion, what, how can we reconcile that statement? with the age we seem to have entered, which for the foreseeable future is an age of wars without victories? Well, I think, of course, his experience uh, was one of conventional warfare, by and large. I mean, now he entered the atomic age, and in fact, of course, he uh, ultimately was removed from Korea, I think, arguably, because of a statement that started to uh, caused some issues uh, in that age. Um, but his experience was World War I, it was World War II, it was certainly unlimited convention, it was, you know, world war. But it was a war that you can actually seize the hill, plant the flag, and go on to the next battle, and ultimately go home to a victory parade. Uh, and I think certainly speaking of victory with, within that context uh, is, was obviously uh, appropriate. Um, I've often said that the endeavors in which we're engaged now are not uh, those kinds of wars. They're not the human terrain is a decisive terrain in Iraq or Afghanistan. There's no great hill that once you take it uh, and again plant your flag, uh, you now control all that you survey. Um, so what you're after, in fact, I don't even use terms like uh, defeat or victory. Uh, if I can avoid it. I don't use the terms optimist or pessimist, frankly, because a couple of times I allowed as how I was a qualified optimist as a three-star in Iraq with respect to certain tasks, laid out the qualifications, but by the time that phrase got back to Washington, it had been stripped of its nuance and I was labeled optimistic. Uh, and, I, you know, ever after that, I said, I'm not, I, you know, people, would, they, people want to know, are you, you know, it's hugely important to them especially candidly with respect, Senator, congressional delegations. I mean, and that's fair. That's their oversight role. They wanted to know, you know, how's it going, General? Are you an optimist? I hope you are uh, for the, some. And, you know, again, so you, I said, I'm not an optimist. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. And reality is that it's, it's hard in Iraq, and it's hard all the time, and it's going to continue to be hard. Next question, you know, and so that wouldn't always completely satisfy, but again, that was to get at the heart of this issue that you're raising, that what you're trying to do is to make progress. You're trying to keep pressure on Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is, is a network, and again, you have to pressure it everywhere. You can't just, again, do the whack-a-mole. You can't whack in one place and have it pop up in another. You've got to whack it everywhere that you can find it, 
It takes, and, and by the way, that's why we have built a network to take on a network. Our uh, high-end military forces that do this business, which about 90% of the effort is focused in the Central Command area, and that commander is out there the bulk of the time, uh, that's what we're endeavoring to do. But to do it, by the way, not just in a military sense, but in a whole of government approach. And beyond that, by the way, in a whole of governments with an S on the end, because you want to get partners involved in it. You know, Winston Churchill had it right when he said the only thing worse than allies is not having any. Uh, I mean, you, you don't want to go it alone in this stuff. Um, yes, it's not easy. And yes, some of them bring caveats. We have, you know, again, uh, but get on with it. It's like any leadership of any organization anywhere. You're trying to bring the best out. You're trying to build a team and trying to bring the best out and all those who are members of the team. And that means identifying strengths and weaknesses, capitalizing on the strengths and compensating for weaknesses. So again, that's what you're trying to do. Uh, but this takes, again, remember the Anaconda plan just for Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Think of that about Al-Qaeda writ large. And that is indeed how we have to take this on. And that's why, again, I think notions of planting flags and so forth aren't well placed when you're talking about these kinds of efforts. Thank you for your statements. Can we Thanks. take one more question over okay. there? Okay. Good more. afternoon. Um, my question is in respect to uh, the non-kinetic tactics that you were using in an anaconda strategy. And could you give some specific examples of uh, successful programs or projects or partnerships that use civilian personnel um, engaging with the local population in either Iraq or Afghanistan? Oh, I mean, they were innumerable. Um, first of all, we had very substantial resources. Um, beyond the money that was provided for the large reconstruction effort, we had, I think, for example, in fiscal year 2009, somewhere north of a billion dollars of what's called Commander's uh, Emergency Reconstruction Money uh, Program. Hugely important. This stemmed, by the way, from a conversation I had with Ambassador Bremer in May of 2003 when he came up to Mosul, and things were going pretty well up there. We had a governor, we had the people who were with us, and all the rest of this is before a few other things took place that, that made it a good bit tougher. But uh, he said, well, what do you need, General? Uh, and I said, sir, we need money. Money is the most important ammunition we could have at this point in the fight. By the way, ammunition is pretty important ammunition when people are shooting at you. So don't get it, you know, somebody in the counterinsurgency field manual wanted to put in there that, you know, again, money is the most important ammunition or, you know, weapons that don't shoot are the most important. I said, well, you obviously haven't been shot at then. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we changed it. By the way, that's still on the web uh, as a dr final draft. It wasn't anywhere near a final draft. I hadn't yet taken control of the electrons. But anyway, we, so we had, for ex foremost among these, I think, was the provincial reconstruction teams. These were teams uh, led by civilians. Many, by the way, former serving ambassadors came back on uh, as either as contractors or on active uh, Department of State duty and volunteered to lead these teams. And we had them married up with every brigade commander in Iraq. And of course, we had 20 brigades in Iraq at the maneuver brigades, ground maneuver combat brigades at the height of the surge. Every one of them had um, one of these senior civilians, uh, again, a few actually led by ambassadors, others by very senior uh, foreign service officers or former FSOs. Uh, and then they had a mixture of civilian and and military with various skills, some from civil affairs and the reserves who had a lot of uh, skills out in uh, local economies and so forth that were very, very helpful. And we did all kinds of project with those so that when we would clear an area, that we would immediately get in there, we'd bring this commander's emergency reconstruction program money with us. Uh, we had certain authorities, you know, a battalion could, commander could spend up to here, brigade commander, division commander, and so forth. Uh, and we had rules and regulations and oversight for it, and we kept tightening those too because you do learn lessons over time. Uh, and they were enormously valuable. I mean, we rebuilt uh, all kinds of, of schools, small medical clinics. Uh, fish farm was one of my favorites. Uh, south of Baghdad, we were much into the fish farm industry. We were into alternative energy. We had windmills powering water pumps. We rebuilt irrigation systems. Uh, we reestablished uh, honeybee industries. I mean, you name it. We got involved in this stuff. Small amounts of money that were effectively priming the pump 
in a country that has vast potential economic wealth, uh, and all we had to do was just get it going. And uh, in many cases, that was what we were able to do by these partnerships. Then you go up a little bit further, the partnership between the ambassador, me, and the Corps of Engineers, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Once we got them on the ground to do the big engineering piece, and they spent, again, this is now over the years, there are billions of dollars on huge projects uh, to reestablish energy and uh, rebuild uh, various oil facilities and all the rest of that. And, and it, then simultaneously, we're bringing the security situation under control, getting the level of violence down, and that enabled us to re-erect electrical towers and rebuild pipelines, build pipeline exclusion zones, and again, learn more about generation of electricity than you know, I ever wanted to know. But we had to do that. And we built fusion cells as well between military and civilian. Um, we did this early on. One last example. Early on, as the commander in Iraq, when I went back and pretty stunned at the level of violence, candidly, as I went out and saw the damage that had been done by the sectarian violence. In my second meeting with Prime Minister Maliki, he said, uh, as I was leaving the room, uh, this is in my second week, he said, hey, General, by the way, could you detain the Deputy Minister of Health? And I thought it was a mistranslation. Uh, and uh, so I got the translator. I said, he didn't really say what I think he said, did he, or what you said? He said, he so went back and confirmed. He said, yeah, I want you to detain the Deputy Minister of Health. Now think of this. This is like detaining, you know, the Deputy Cabinet level official of our government. And oh, he said, by the way, and while you're at it, detain the general who's the head of their, uh, the health security office as well, the overall thousands of uh, facility protection security forces that guarded facilities all around Iraq. I said, okay, got it, we'll get after that. You know, I said, is there a reason for this? And we got that, you know, and understood that. Um, well, then I started getting into, okay, now, you know, good news is we've taken down the guy that was sort of running, the, actually hijacked the Ministry of Health with the militia's help. Uh, what are we going to do about it now? So I went to the ambassador and said, you know, do you have a health attache or is there anybody, you know, where's your, your Ministry of Health capacity building teams? And uh, so I found out there was one great woman, one, who was helping the Ministry of Health. So I tracked her down. I mean, she was obviously the most overworked woman in Iraq and uh, said, hey, you know, you're doing the Lord's work here. Um, violence is going down a bit for us now. Um, would, how would you like to have, say, a handful of doctors, supervisory nurses, medical logisticians, hospital administrators, uh, clinicians, and a variety of others that we have in these different military hospitals that we had all around Iraq, and we had a little bit of excess capacity? We can pull them together, and oh, by the way, we'll throw in an infantry platoon or two for security, and we'll bring the vehicles and the chow and the radios and everything else, you know what I mean? Obviously, this was of enormous value. And so we built those kinds of teams as well. Look, this is about a team effort. It's about civil military partnerships. Uh, Ambassador Crocker and I sat down early on and said, we are gonna work together, we're gonna be a team. Um, occasionally, we'd, you know, we'd have a, a difference of opinion, but I would defer to him. Politics trumps the military in this kind of endeavor. A couple of times I went to him and said, hey, what do you think? You know, what's your sense of going into Sadr City tonight? There's a pretty prominent target in there, and he said, ah, atmospherics aren't good, let's hold off. I would defer to him. And we had a very, very good partnership. Uh, we built a joint campaign plan, military and civilian. Uh, we built everything together, did all of our campaign plan reviews together. So from the very top all the way down to the very bottom, we tried to transmit uh, an, an imperative that again, we were going to work as a team and cooperation again was not optional. And we found a couple of miscreants, as they say, and um, who were, didn't really believe we meant what we said, and then we, we showed that indeed we did. So it's hugely important. Thank you. Well, well unfortunately, we've reached the end of our time with uh, the general, and uh, with that, let me close this out by thanking you not only for sharing your insights with us today and for your exemplary service to the country, not only on the battlefield, but also intellectually and in stimulating uh, new ways of thinking about the challenges and opportunities that face the country, uh, but also in stimulating the next generation of thinkers and doers of the country. Thanks a lot. Go Tech. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.